gentlemen and my dear children. It appears to be extremely old-fashioned in these days of the great apostasy to even mention the blood mother of Jesus Christ. She has been the target of the sharpest arrows ever pointed against a human being. And these arrows came from the quiver of her own sons and daughters. Where she stands today, queen, alongside her blessed, immaculate, divine son, seated in heaven. And if it were possible to shed tears there, her eyes would be streaming torrents of them, because particularly the bishops, few in number, the priests, many in number, and the laity, myriads of them, who have assaulted her with their sharpest criticisms. The dear mother of Jesus Christ is necessary in the life of the church, in the life of Christ, in your life and in my life. For without her, and this is no exaggeration, definitely there would be no Christ. There would be no church. There would be no solid Christians such as you good people. Do you recollect that something has happened to mankind? Not because I say so, but because it is evidenced about us. It is evidenced, first of all, in nature. All its eruptions, volcanoes, torrents, floods, earthquakes, droughts, and deserts were once fertile soil obtained. It is also discernible in living nature. The beasts of the fields of the forests have turned against men. It is most significantly present in human nature. Here is human nature probably dwelling upon this planet for a million years or more. Here is human nature from the very beginning, evidently, trying to rise above the Stone Age, the Ice Age, the Barbaric Ages, which scientists sometimes say extend as far back as ten million years. And all this time, so they tell us, incidentally, the same men who tell us this, tell us there is no God, and tell us there is no Immaculate Mother, and tell us there is no Heaven. These scientists tell us that man groveled in the soil amongst the rocks and on the hillsides in a barbaric frenzy and struggle for life. They tell us that men made progress. And what little progress did they make? The age of Pericles amongst the Greeks, the age of Augustus Caesar amongst the Romans, and the age before them of the Egyptians with their small territorial advancements and civilizations only mock the great age of ignorance. The great age where men by themselves were incapable of trying even to rid themselves of poverty, of hatred, of war, and of all the other ills to which human flesh is heir. I believe it was the great St. Athanasius in the condensation of his sermons who said that 
man had proven by his historic relatives that he was incapable of solving life's problems and that it was necessary for Christ to come here to do for us what history had proven we were incapable of doing for ourselves. Very well. Where does our Blessed Mother fit into this statement? Or fit into this history? Or fit into your presence as you listen to these words? When God created man, one thing was uppermost in his mind. He must never destroy the creation in the sense that he would vitiate free will. Because if there was a heaven for man, it must be a heaven that's gained by man's efforts, graced by God. And if man, therefore, is gifted with the prospect of gaining heaven, he is also gifted with earning it in a degree by his own efforts. Therefore, when it was time for Christ to come upon earth, Almighty God did not insist upon a virgin mother becoming his mother. He asked her, would she become the mother of God? And her reply was, be it done unto me according to thy word. Instantaneously, therefore, and by the power and operation of the Holy Spirit, it happened. It happened that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Blessed Trinity, the giver of life, came into the womb of Mary and there performed the miracle of giving life to the open that was Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Mary voluntarily, therefore, became the mother of Christ. Mary voluntarily, therefore, and by the power and operation of the Holy Spirit, started the great, great romance of Christ, not only the Redeemer, who died to save all sinners, and to placate Almighty God for the terrible infamy of sin, but became also our Savior. Two different items, Savior and Redeemer. And without Mary, probably, this would never have happened. But to save us was one thing, over and above redeeming us. To save us meant that he would have to give us certain aids, certain sacraments, certain graces to enable us to do with his aid what by ourselves we could never accomplish. And thus Mary is sometimes referred to not only as the co-redemptress with Jesus Christ, but most definitely as the co-savior with Jesus Christ. I wonder what life had been on earth before Mary's time in the minds of persons. Human persons certainly believed in some deity. The Greeks believed that the Mount Olympus was filled with deities manufactured by their imagination to suit their purposes of life. The Romans had as their great deity not only Jupiter, but also Mars, the god of slaughter, the god of bloodshed, the god of conquest. The Egyptians had as their deity not only Isis, but also Osiris, the god of lust, the god of carnality. Just the same as they are erecting today the god of war and the God of carnality. Days without Christ. Days without Mary. And still we go to the story of Mary. For all eternity, of course, the second person of the Blessed Trinity 
Uh -huh. Jew. That eventually he was about to become man. That eventually he was about to become like us in all things save sin. That eventually he too would have a mother as you and I had a mother. And what do you suppose happened to this mother of God? I ask you as I ask myself. Because if it were in my power before my birth, which is an idle dream, but if it were, and if it were in yours too, you and I would have possessed for our mothers the choicest, greatest gifts and accomplishments in the mind of a man to bestow upon her as priceless jewels. And of all things else, we would have seen that she had the beauty that is incomparable in all other persons, save God. In all things else, we would have crowned her with the jewels of grace, wisdom, understanding and knowledge, for example, purity, love, ah oh, yes, love, just this side of infinity. And we would have given her life everlasting, because if she used to be the mother of our choice, she must be the best in the world. Well, what then do you think of this boy Christ, of this infant Christ, of this God Christ who existed long before he became man? He who had infinity and eternity to plan for his mother, what do you think he would have done? Do not deny him what you yourself, what I myself have. I know what he would have done. He would have stolen the gold from the sunsets. He would have taken the song from the birds. He would have given the flowers of all creation to his mother's blush. He would have endowed her with every natural gift. And he would have looked at the seraphim and cherubim who long before pre-existed her. And he would have surpassed their beauty, their intelligence, their wisdom. He would have surpassed everything known to human beings, to angelic beings, to give to this, our painted nature's solitary boast, the queenly virtues that he alone could give her. And this he did. For do you think that you or I have greater love for our mother than that he? Greater esteem for her than that he? Not at all. He had it in the superlative sense. In the infinite sense. And there stands Mary then from all eternity. Planned by God. Adorned by God. Mothered by God to become the mother of Christ and of all Christ's brothers and sisters down the corridor of years until the end of time. I'll tell you this because you know it already, merely to remind you that in these days of modernism, when the quiver of hatred filled the arrows of death, are pointed at this girl, this queen, this mother, by her own sons, sons whom Jesus Christ had said, you are my brothers, sons who be brought to his altar and ordained as priests, sons who be brought to his great altar in the cathedral and consecrated as bishops in some instances. And they, within the household, have pointed their arrows of venom at Mary. My dear fellow Catholics and Christians, just as there could be no Christ without Mary, there can be no mystical body of Christ without Mary. I mean no church without Mary. Just as Christ was necessary to give his life for the sins of the world to Almighty God the Father, just as Christ was necessary to establish the church, which is his other self, with all its sacraments, to be our Savior, 
giving us the blessed Eucharist to guarantee resurrection from the dead, giving us baptism to guarantee our brotherhood with him, giving us our confirmation to make us soldiers in his army, giving us extra munction to be died and rise from the dead gloriously. Just as all this was necessary, it could not have happened without Mary. And that is why it is almost possible for us to look upon such miscreant, misguided priests that receive so much publicity in these our days as Father Koenig, Father Rahner, Father Herring, Father Bohm, Father Schillenbanks, the priests who received publicity because they dastardly assault Mary, dastardly assault the mystical body of Christ, dastardly endeavor to nail it again to the cross of materialism, to the cross of secularism, and to elevate the strumpets of the street to the high throne occupied by Mary, the immaculate, pure mother of God. And who gives them this publicity? Not the real Catholics, but the anti-Catholic press and radio and television. Who gives them this publicity except the magazines of a secularistic nature making important personages of them when they should be buried in obscurity? You know, this is the age of democracy also. And I remember once the J.K. Kate Chesterton once said that democracy not only takes in the living but also the dead because the dead are not obsoleted in the sense that they have lived no longer. Death is an accident as is poverty an accident. And as an in democracy every poor person has a vote and every poor person has a privilege of having his voice recognized so also the dead should have their voices recognized because they are not dead. They too belong to the family of democracy, which in its right meaning is the family of Jesus Christ that stretches back from Adam and will last down to the latest child born before the destruction of the world. And in the sense of democracy, a Christian sense, what have those who've lived since Christ's time and before the time of the Schillenbeeks and the Canes and the Bones, what have they said of Mary? Why not one of the fathers of the church ever disbelieved in Mary? And yet they claim these moderns a reverence for democracy and at the same time they disclaim and abort the reverence that a Thomas of Aquin, a Bonaventure, a Duns Scotus, a Matthew, Mark, a Luke, a John, and all the popes and bishops and priests since the year 300 down to the latest century have held for her. They are not Democrats. They are fakers prostituting their priesthood under the cover of democracy, as if that meant something in these days. And yet, there stands Mary, and there will stand Mary, our tainted nature's solitary boast, to keep on giving us Christ, not only at the eternal sacrifice of the Mass, but to keep on giving us Christ through his grace of the sacraments. For just as in days before Christ when there were no sacraments, just as in the days before Christ when there was war and hatred and famine, so to today you can expect the same evils to reappear, even though our technocratic age gives us atomic and nuclear power, even though our technical advancements give us all this transportation and instant communication, it will only multiply poverty, the worst kind of poverty, the poverty of faith that obliterates God, that cancels out heaven, that destroys 
love and that makes animals out of men who are supposed to be God's brothers and God the Father's children. Get rid of Mary and you'll get rid of Washington and you'll get rid of London and Paris and Moscow and you'll get rid of every other capital in the world and yes, you will have the desegregation of mankind when all of us will sink down to the lowest level of animality and slavery and lust and death. Everlasting death. Do not be ashamed, therefore, to say your beads. Do not be ashamed, therefore, to say proudly, without Mary there is no Christ in the past, and without Mary there is no Christ in the future. Do not be ashamed to elevate the queen to the altars of your home as Christ elevated her to be queen of the angels and saints in heaven. God bless America, the first country in the world to be dedicated to the Immaculate Conception. God bless America. May he keep the nation strong and keep it strong only by keeping the families within it strong and the families in it can only be kept strong by keeping Mary the model of Christianity in the hearts of the children in the hearts of the parents in the hearts of the homes God bless you today and forever thank you this program was produced and distributed by Keep the Faith.